Hey everyone, in this video we are talking about computer memory and variables. We'll be looking at the contents of both F3.2, main memory of a computer, and F3.3, uh, which covers variables. So, main memory, I believe we briefly talked about, um, and if you have taken uh, CBiz 101, you are probably familiar with, but essentially main memory temporarily stores data for each program running on your computer. Um, when you turn your computer on, a whole bunch of stuff is put into main memory. Uh, you know, it has all the instructions for programs that are running. Uh, it holds information for those programs, so any values that are in properties or results of calculations or any information given by users, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so data for calculations and instructions for actually running the programs are all stored in main memory. And then when you turn off your computer, all of that gets deleted. So typically, um, if you want to actually save anything long term, you have to save it to what's known as secondary storage. That's besides the point. Main memory is the space where programs live and the space where programs can store things like um, you know, any data that they want to hold on to for whatever reason. Now, in modern times, this main memory is called random access memory or RAM. Um, the reason why it's random access isn't the most important. It's essentially you can access any part of memory you want without having to look through the entire thing. Whereas back when tapes were the way you know, we stored memory, uh, you actually had to scroll through an entirety of a tape in order to get a specific piece of data at a specific location in memory. But we'll get to that in a little more specifics in just a sec. So we can think of memory as being made of shelves that can hold data or slots where we can store data or, you know, maybe p parts of a bookshelf where we can put, you know, books that contain data or something like that. But each slot, however you want to think about it, I'm thinking about it as a shelf right now, a shelf in like a uh, set of lockers or whatever. Each uh, shelf is the same size and it holds the same amount of data, which is typically one byte. Um, one byte is eight bits. It is eight binary digits together. Can represent numbers from zero to 255. Um, but we actually use bytes to store all kinds of information and we'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah, each shelf holds one byte. Uh, it can only hold one byte. You can't stack two bytes of information on there. If you tried to do that, you would end up clearing out the byte that was already there and replacing it with the byte that you're trying to stack on top of it. Each shelf also has a unique address, which means that, you know, it's like a, you know, if you think about the Dewey Decimal System, or if you think about um, house addresses or something like that, where uh, if you want to find something, all you have to do is look for the correct address, and then you can get the data from that correct address. Uh, with that whole random access part, uh, the computer doesn't even have to look through all of the addresses until it finds the right one. It can go just directly to the right shelf or something like that. Now programs can actually request sort of bundles of shelves. You know, maybe it will request like four shelves together to store four bytes worth of, inf of information. And we're going to uh, call these bundles memory locations. Um, it essentially has to request enough shelves to hold the data that they need to store or whatever. So um, if you want to hold, if you wanted to hold a single letter back in the day where we only cared about like, you know, letters in the English alphabet along with some accents and numbers and maybe some special symbols like space and enter and all that kind of stuff. Um, it only needs, would use one shelf. However, in modern times where we actually consider languages with other scripts, you know, other lettering systems like Arabic or Hebrew or something like that, and also consider emojis, all that kind of stuff, 
we usually use two shelves to hold a single letter. Eight shelves we use to store information about the current date. Um, and one, uh, somewhere between one to 16 shelves to store individual numbers, but it depends on a lot of factors that we'll get into when we talk about variable types. But when a program requests memory, you know, a memory location that holds a certain amount of shelves, those memory locations might be of different sizes. So some memory locations might be two shelves, two bytes. Some of them might be eight, some of them might be 16. Some of them might be extremely, extremely, extremely large of indeterminate size, like maybe um, 200 bytes or, you know, just some crazy numbers because they're holding a very long string, which we talked about strings in chapter one. But all those memory locations might be different sizes and those memory locations are going to be given the address associated with the first shelf that they contain. So the important part about this is that if we have a memory location, we know that a memory location includes a number of consecutive shelves that start at a particular address, then we can refer to that address in order to find the information kept in all of those shelves. And essentially what we're doing is we're um, breaking apart all of the data contained within that memory location so that all that data can be fit onto each of the shelves. So if we have a number that takes 16 shelves to store, then we're breaking the data for that number up into 16 pieces. And then whenever we use it, we kind of reassemble it in order to get that information back out. But yeah, that's the idea. We have memory locations. Uh, that hold data, those memory locations could be of different sizes, and we have the address of those memory locations so that we can store data in those memory locations and also retrieve data from those memory locations. Now this is how the textbook likes to think about it, where they have a whole bunch of different lockers like this of different sizes, and you can essentially rent out a locker and put any information that you need to store in there. So for example, the radius from the circle, uh, the, the, the circle um, area application, we get the radius from the uh, text box that the user entered, and then we convert it into a number and we stick it in to memory location at address 10. And then when we calculate the area, we stick that into the, um, the locker, the memory location at address 12. Now, Im what's important here is that we have already rented out lockers 10 and 12, memory locations at addresses 10 and 12 at the very beginning of our procedure. So you actually have to rent out the lockers before you can actually start using them, sort of like at a public pool or something like that. But once you've rented them out, you're free to store whatever as long as it fits in there and as long as it's the correct type of data. When you rent them out, you say ahead of time, hey, I want to put numbers of this size in here, or I want to put information about the current date in here, or I want to put, um, I want to put like a string of text in here or something like that. You have to do that ahead of time. Once you fill out all the right paperwork and do all that kind of stuff, you're free to use those lockers for those purposes. Now, what's important to note is that these memory addresses are probably not going to have these addresses like this, and the addresses probably aren't going to be consecutive. So uh, we might, if this did indeed start at one, this might be start at five, uh, or no, you know, maybe this has two shelves in it. So this would have shelves one and two in here. This would start at three. This could have four shelves in there. So three, four, five, six. And now this one starts at seven, seven, eight, and so on and so forth. It doesn't um, super matter at this level of programming because we're not really getting into the plumbing the depths of the computer and all that kind of stuff. Um, Typically, we don't even see the addresses because we're going to associate a name with those addresses 
and then we can use that name and Visual Basic will then say, okay, well, I know that this name is associated with this address. So when the user says this name, they're referring to the data stored at this address. So when you, that's part of the whole renting out the locker procedure is associating a name with those addresses. And what I'm leading up to right here is actually that whole declaring variables thing that I talked about in the last video. Now with memory, uh, the computer automatically fills out some RAM locations for, you know, instructions for programs that you open. This includes instructions for the operating system to follow as well, uh, and data entered by users of programs. For example, if someone is entering the radius into the circle area application, which then can be accessed through the program through text radius dot text, which is associated with the memory location of that radius data. Another example is if you are typing a document in Microsoft Word, all of that text is going into memory. A programmer like yourself can reserve memory for your own use. Like I was talking about before, you're storing intermediate values for calculations, uh, such as double radius or double area, the two um, variables that I mentioned in the first video of this chapter. This process is called declaring a memory location when you are telling the computer, hey, I need to use memory and I want it associated with the name double radius or double area. And then the computer will then in turn assign a, an address for a memory location to that name. And this is where we get into variables. So a variable is a type of memory location where a program can temporarily store data. Uh, it will be stored while the application is running, sort of. Um, more on this in a later video, but it is stored uh, while the application is running, and it goes away when the application stops running. Uh, the th important thing about variables is that you can store values in variables, but then you can modify that value. You can overwrite its contents. The value of it is variable, and we call this uh, a mutable memory location. That's not a term that's in the textbook, but it's one that's important to remember if you continue on coding, is that variables, in general, variables are mutable. At least in this context. Um, you can have non-mutable variables in other programming languages, but in Visual Basic, we tend to think of variables as always being mutable. You can always change what's inside of them. When you store data in a variable, you are able to control the preciseness of data, uh, how much detail is stored in that value, especially if you have a number with a lot of decimal points or something like that. You can decide how many you want to hold on to, or if you want to, if you have a very, very, very large number, you can decide whether you want to hold on to all of that or if you want to like trim some of it off or something. Uh, you can verify that the data meets certain requirements, especially if the user has input some data and then you want to make sure that their input is valid, and we'll talk more about that later. But you can verify that data meets certain requirements, that it's correct and it's usable for your program. And you can save data for later use, like what we did with the um, label radius, or sorry, the text radius dot text thing, where we took the user's input and then we stored it in a variable for us to use later. Or when we calculated the area and we stored that in a variable for us to then use later when we're um, putting that value into a label to show the user. Now it's going to be slightly more efficient. In most cases, it'll be slightly more efficient, but there might be some cases where it is extremely more efficient to, it's more efficient to put data in variables rather than leaving it in control properties. Because with the control properties, it actually takes longer for you to access control properties that you know Visual Basic kind of has more control over than it does to access variables that you have much more direct control of within your procedures and within your classes and all that kind of stuff. You, it's sort of like closer to you, so it's faster to access them. But also you don't have to worry about things like repeatedly converting types 
So you don't have to worry about repeatedly converting user input from a string to a number or something like that. You can just do it once and then you don't have to worry about the conversion again. You can just use the numerical value. So it's a lot faster. It takes up more memory to use them, of course, but that doesn't matter because computers have so much RAM these days. So we care a lot more about speed. And when it comes to speed, using variables rather than trying to keep everything, you know, inside of uh, controls and stuff like that that are a lot further away and it takes longer to access, that's, you know, keep them close to you. Use variables. We talked about declaring variables at the very beginning of a procedure, and that's sort of like checking out the locker in order to use the shelves within to store your data. You have to tell Visual Basic ahead of time that you want to use a variable with a particular name of a particular type. And when you do that, Visual Basic knows that it should request from the computer a certain amount of memory. It should request the number of shelves that you actually need, so then you can store data there. If you don't tell the computer ahead of time, at least in Visual Basic, then it's not going to know that you need those shelves. So then when you try to start doing work with it, uh, it's going to start causing problems. Or at least it would cause problems, except for the fact that Visual Basic actually catches you and says, hey, you need to declare this first. Well, it, it usually catches you, but more on that in the options statement video. But, you know, if you declare all of that ahead of time, you're telling Visual Basic at the very beginning of your procedure how much memory you need so then it can actually get that memory for you so then you can actually store all of the data you need to. So that's really important. It assigns a name to that variable and it says what type that variable is, so what kind of data it's going to hold. And then computer associates your use of that name with data in that location by saying, okay, well, the name is connected to this address and the data is in this address. So that's important. And it also associates and enforces the types of values in that variable so that you can't put the wrong type of value into that variable. You can't put a string into, a into the uh, address space of a variable that is supposed to contain numbers, for example at least not without trying to convert it. So, and that's really important because then like you, if a string is way too big, if it has like, you know, the entirety of, I don't know, Moby Dick or something in it, it's a very long string. And you're trying to cram all of that into a number that can actually cause a lot of problems because not only does it overwrite everything that's in your number area, but if the programming language isn't really careful about it, it could even start overwriting other things, even getting so bad as to overwriting data for other programs. And that's actually a security risk. And that's used to be, and sometimes actually still is a major way that um, hackers can exploit poorly written programs in order to inject their own code into them and start putting, you know, doing malicious stuff is they uh, put values that are too big into spaces that are too small and then it starts overwriting other programs instructions and then those other programs start behaving maliciously and stealing your data or destroying your hard drive or whatever so visual basic won't let you do that because it could be really dangerous if you did that um if you were able to do that so yeah it enforces the types of values in that variable now, declaring your variable, it's the dim statement. Dim stands for dimension, um, which is a holdover from very early days of programming, where when you're, uh, it has to do with like the size, requesting a certain size of memory and thinking about it as like the dimensions of that, you know, storage unit or whatever. I'm not completely familiar with it, to be honest. I'm a much newer programmer than uh, describing it as a dimension. I think it had something to do with something called arrays, which is not what we're talking about right now. Regardless, what you say is you say dim, capital D, I M, uh, and then you put the name of the variable, and we'll talk about naming conventions in a sec, as, and then the type of the variable, and we'll also talk about the type of the variable in a sec. But for example, dim int quantity as integer. So we're declaring a, uh, variable called int quantity 
it's going to hold integers, numbers without decimal points. So, you know, you could put numbers like 3 or 7 or negative 25 or whatever inside of int quantity, but you couldn't put something like 4.7 because that's not an integer, it's a number with a decimal point. So, we're saying, hey, we're, we need a um, variable called int quantity. It needs to be able to hold integers, so please request enough memory to put integers inside of it but also please make sure that we're only putting integers inside of this and not strings or other types of data and when we say this when we just say dim int quantity as integer it has an initial value of zero which is the initial value for all integers so when you say this statement um you get memory allocated to you that holds enough that has enough space for an integer and it currently has the value zero. All of your integers, when you declare them like this, will start out as zero. But that's how you do it. You type dim, the name of your variable, as, and then the type of data that that variable will hold. There's a lot of data types in Visual Basic, but we're not going to worry about most of them. We are just worrying about the uh, five data types that are listed in this table right here. These are the only five that are really considered by the book. So the first one is Boolean. Uh, it's a logical value for true or false. What a Boolean value says is I, it allows you to say things like, I assert that some statement is a true statement. Or I assert that some statement is a false statement or some expression, I should be saying. Some expression, some fragment of a statement, some piece of code is true or I assert that this is false. So if you wanted to say something like, I assert that two plus two equals five, then that would evaluate to a Boolean value. In this case, it would evalu evaluate to the false value. And we'll talk more about booleans in the future. But a, the true and false stuff allows you to say the statement is a true statement. I, I assert that the statement is, statement is a true statement, or I assert that the statement is a false statement. The default value for the, a boolean variable, if you uh, create a boolean variable using the dim statement, uh, dim is five or dim is um is hungry or whatever uh or boolean hungry or whatever um as boolean when you say that kind of thing the initial value will be false until you set it to be something else uh, and it takes up two bytes it takes up two shelves why it takes up two i don't know it really could take up one if it wanted to but there's probably something going on behind the scenes but you know that's beyond me. In most programming languages, you could use a one byte. Uh, I, I shouldn't say most programming languages, because I, I don't know behind the scenes on most of them, but there are programming languages that use a one byte value for true or false. Regardless, uh, booleans are a logical value, default value of false, and they take up two bytes of space. Now, uh, the next three are actually our numeric data types. So the next three actually deal with holding numbers. And, and we're going to talk about them in terms of like how much data they are able to hold, ordering them from greatest amount to least amount. So the first type is the decimal. Uh, it does contain numbers with a decimal place. Um, and it's able to contain 29 significant digits. So not including things like leading zeros, zeros at the very beginning, or zeros at the very end, or something like that. Range is typically, uh, the smallest value is negative this big number, and positive this big number. It can contain most values between those numbers, as long as they have 29 significant digits. So you couldn't have this number minus 
you know, positive this number minus 0 0.5 because that would be 30 significant digits, it wouldn't be able to hold on to that. That would get rounded down. So you also can get really close to zero, but not actually being zero. I believe the closest you could get was one to the negative. I mean, either something I don't remember. There's like a really, really close value that you could get that's not actually zero. Um, I was reading through the specifications actually when I was preparing this lecture. It's really crazy how much uh, what what the different ranges are for like different numbers of decimal points and all that kind of stuff. But essentially, between negative one times this number and positive one times this number, it can contain every number with 29 significant digits. So there's a lot of uh, space that it takes up in order to hold all the data. It takes up 16 bytes, 16 whole shelves. Um, it takes up the equivalent of eight Boolean values in order to hold all of that, which might not seem impressive actually, given that the Booleans are just true or false, but it holds a lot of information here. And the default value is zero. When you declare a decimal uh, variable, a variable of type decimal, its default value will be zero. All right, so doubles are the next one. They are also numbers with a decimal place uh, with 18 significant digits this time instead of 29. Uh, they're called doubles because of a concept called like a double floating point thing uh, that is, you know, well beyond what we have to worry about for this class, double floating point precision. But they are, uh, they, they hold decimal places or numbers with decimal places, so any irrational numbers or anything like that. Um, their range is between uh, plus or minus 1.797 times 10 to the 308th power. For the most part, it can't actually capture every single number within that range, but for most numbers that we're going to use, um, it'll be good enough. If you really want precision, if you want, if you're working with calculations with really important numbers, like you're doing financial stuff or like medical data or something like that, uh, you're going to use the decimal type because that's actually has precision. That's actually able to keep track of everything precisely. All of that numeric data is going to be stored in there precisely. Uh, you're not going to lose any of it. Decimals are, however, really slow to work with because of all of that precision. So they're good for the important calculations. Doubles are not good because you can actually lose data. You can warp your um, data values that you are working with. They're a lot less precise and they usually rely on approximations of particularly, particularly tricky numbers to work with. However, they're a lot faster and thus, you know, they work pretty well for most um, purposes that require decimal points. You don't really need to worry so much about decimals. Uh, their default value is zero and they take up eight bytes of data to store all of these 18 significant digits as well as the um, power of... it looks like a power of 10. Really it's storing a power of 2. Uh, but you know that gets into the implementation of the whole thing and that's a whole mess. But yeah, doubles are fast but they are not precise. Now let me show you what I mean about doubles not being precise, or floating point numbers in general, of which doubles are one. You know, they're not being, they're not super precise. So this is a, um, this is actually Python. This isn't Visual Basic. Uh, the reason why I'm using Python is because it lets me input code in live and not have to like build up an application and compile stuff and then run it and all that kind of stuff. I don't really want to worry about that. So instead I'm just using live Python in order to show off a very basic technique. But even though this is Python, this actually should hold pretty true for Visual Basic as well, since they both use floating point numbers based on the same specifications. So uh, if we think about the number one third, one third, if you try to convert that to a decimal point, you get an, or you know, a decimal point representation, you're going to get 
an infinitely repeating number where you have 0 0.3, 3, 3, 3, 3, and so on and so forth. And that goes on forever, but we don't deal with forever when we're actually working with numbers. So when I type in something like one divided by three, uh, it's going to cut off at some point. And that is an approximation. And that approximation is something that you have to work with when it comes to numbers like this, numbers that repeat forever or irrational numbers that will go on forever with no pattern or something like that. Not even the decimal can really escape that kind of fate. However, floating point numbers are a little bit weird because of the way that they encode numbers. I'm not going to get into the specifics of it, but it's a weird way of actually holding on to values. Now, I talked a little bit before, I believe, about how computers actually talk in binary. They don't think about numbers in base 10 like we do. They think about numbers in binary. Now, the thing with that is that they, you know, we have numbers in base 10 that we can represent just fine, but computers can't actually represent at all. And I want to draw the comparison to how with one third, for example, 0 0.33333 going on repeating and repeating and stuff like that, or something like, you know, one divided by seven going on forever. Uh, that has to do with the fact that, you know, three and 10, they don't really share any common prime factors or seven and 10 don't share any common prime factors or something like that. Now, when we think about that idea and we apply it to binary, if I tried to do one divided by 10, uh, one tenth is not a very fun number in binary because it actually is infinitely repeating. Uh, two does go into 10, but that remainder that or that leftover that five isn't actually a uh, a number that is divisible by two and because five isn't divisible by two you get into some really weird stuff um however if i type in one divided by ten like this it's a little bit smart because it knows that it's 0 0.1 in base 10. So it's not actually showing us that this is an infinitely repeating number that it had to cut off at some point in order to actually fit it into a floating point amount of data. It's not actually showing us that, but it's there in the background, that infinite repeating value of 0 0.1. And you can actually expose it if you do the right math. 0 0.1, which is that infinitely repeating number plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 will still give us an infinitely repeating number, but we would expect a computer to say, oh, well, that's equal to 0 0.3. Well, that's not 0 0.3. That's 0 0.3 and then a lot of zeros and then a four at the end. That is an artifact of that lack of precision. Because floating point numbers are dealing with approximations, that 0 0.1 with like all the repeating stuff gets encoded as an approximation. And then if we add three of those approximations up in just the right way, we get a new approximation, but one that we're not expecting and one that's actually not correct. Uh, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 is another example of this. It does the exact same thing. So this is what I mean by doubles are less precise because they deal with these really weird rounding errors that can actually modify your values a little bit. Now, usually they're precise, to, they're precise enough to the point where something this small doesn't matter and you might have to account for it by rounding at the very end or something like that. But that those imprecise areas are still there and they lie in the places, you know, in the decimal points where maybe things might look a little bit clean on the um, base 10 side of things, on the side of things where we're used to counting, but they might not look very nice on the binary side. All right, so the last numeric type that we'll deal with is integers and their range are between uh, negative 2,147,483,647 and positive of that number. 
Uh, they take up four bytes to encode all of that, and they are precise. There's no approximation or anything like that. So if you don't need to use decimal points and you're not working with huge numbers like that, then using integers are pretty fine. You don't need to worry about doubles or decimals or anything like that. If you're working with huge numbers, decimals. Uh, if you are working with decimal points and you don't care so much about the precision and all that, doubles are fine. But if you're not working with the decimal point numbers at all and the numbers are reasonably small, integers work just great. Uh, their default value is zero and they take up four bytes of information. And then the string, which has all of that text stuff that I talked about in it. You just put text in between quotes and then that text is passed around like an object uh, within the code. Uh, you can have an empty string, so zero characters at all. And you can also have in theory, up to 2 billion characters, although it depends on how much memory the computer is willing to give you for that. But in theory, you could have up to 2 billion characters. Uh, Visual Basic itself allows for that. It's just your computer and the operating system that might get a little grumpy. Uh, the default value is this nothing object. It's not like an empty string. You can have an empty string, which is like two quotes right next to each other with nothing in between. Or you can have nothing which is like some object that represents literally there is nothing in here and they're different concepts. But that's the default value and then you start actually assigning a string to it or something. And the size of it will vary based on the number of characters, individual letters and numbers and spaces and all that kind of stuff that you actually put in there. So hard to say for sure what the uh, size of a string will be until you actually know what the string is. Now with variable names, we have naming rules just like we do for the different controls. Um, there are some that are enforced by Visual Basic and there are some that we will be using in this class, the ones that the book is actually using. So the ones required by Visual Basic, each variable declared in a procedure must have a unique name. You cannot have repeats. The reason why is that the computer would get confused if you had two variables named the same thing, um, it would get confused like which memory address you actually were trying to refer to, the one you first declared with the name or the one you second declared with the name or whatever, and it might make a choice that you don't like or overwrite data that you don't like or something like that. So just to be safe, each variable must have a unique name. The variable names must begin with a letter and they can only contain letters, numbers, and the underscore character. No dollar sign, no at sign, no percent sign, nothing like that. The recommended maximum number of characters to use for a name is 32. Uh, even then, 32 is pretty excessive. Um, your variable name should be pretty short and sweet. Easy to remember, easy to type, all that kind of stuff. You don't want to really make mistakes with that. And the name cannot be a reserved word such as sub or double. You couldn't use dim, as, um, class, all that kind of stuff. And you probably also don't want to use the name of other functions or, sorry, other procedures or other class names or whatever, anything like that. It's best to just stay away from all of that. Although this last rule will be really easy if you follow the naming conventions in this book. Now, the ones we use in this book uh, are actually pretty similar to the ones we use with the control. Uh, each name will begin with an ID of three or maybe more characters that represents the variable's data type. The ID is being listed right here. For Boolean, it's BLN. Uh, for Decimal, it's DEC. For Double, it's DBL. Integer is INT. And String is STR. Uh, and we have some examples right here, but yeah. Uh, after the ID, will indicate the purpose of the variable. That's really important because it's self-documenting to some extent. We know what that variable is supposed to be used for to at least some extent. Um, you'll probably want to clarify it further 
by using a comment to say what the variable is doing as you define it for the first time. But at the very least, you know, with that comment, right, and the descriptive remaining characters after the ID, anyone who's looking at your code, including yourself, is going to really know what that variable is doing. Uh, the other variable name convention we use is that we'll be using camel case again. The ID starts with a lowercase first letter, and then the first letter of every subsequent word that you use is uppercase, is capitalized. So, just like we see in the examples, uh, boolean is insured, is has a capital I, insured has a capital I, double total do, uh, T in total is capitalized, D in do is capitalized, but the uh, D in double at the very beginning, the D in DBL, is not capitalized, and so on and so forth. So those vari variable names by now should be pretty familiar, the conventions that we use for variable names. They should be familiar to you if you have been using conventions like these for the controls. Here's the variable declaration statement again, uh, the dim variable name as type. However, you can put this optional initial value. That's what the square brackets here are for, is that this initial value, this equals initial value is optional. But if you do include it, this allows you to set an initial value that is not equal to the default ones that I outlined in the type table before, like zero for all the numeric ones or false for the boolean and so on and so forth two examples right here uh, for integers we can have a dim int quantity as integer this statement will create the integer variable int quantity and sets it to be zero or we could say dim int count as integer equals one this creates the variable int count but rather than setting it to be zero it sets it equal to be one and what's important is that this initial value should match the type of the um, actual variable. So if this was equal to false or something, that would be a problem. It should be, it should be an integer over here. We have booleans. Uh, dim boolean is ensured as boolean. Uh, this is going to be automatically set to false. We know this because that's the initial value. Although if we wanted to really make it clear and self-documenting and all that to the reader, we could say equals false. It's redundant, but it's helpful for readability uh, and collaboration and me helping you and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, we all have dim boolean is valid as boolean equals true. We would have to set this initial value because true is not the default initial value for boolean. So setting a boolean equal to be false initially is optional, but I would recommend it personally. But if you want to set, make it uh, true initially, then saying equals true here is going to be really helpful. Uh, unless you want to do it in a separate statement, but you might as well do it as you're defining it, as you're declaring it. And then for a string, uh, dim stir message as string. Uh, right now we are putting that weird nothing object in there because we haven't set an initial value that... Um, the message that we put into stir message, into string message, uh, will probably end up being generated based on what the user is doing. And there are mechanisms for doing that that we'll talk about in the future. When you declare variables, you must declare the variables before using them so that the program knows what the name that you are using refers to. It has to associate that name with a memory address which is what it does when you actually declare the variable. So if you don't declare it, then it'll see the name and say, well, I don't recognize a memory address that this is connected to at all. And then it gives you uh, some kind of error. Uh, usually this is because Visual Studio is smart enough to recognize that you used this variable before declaring it and says, hey, uh, you should write a declaration. But if you try to actually run the code, then Visual Basic would say, well, hang on, I don't know what memory address this refers to, so that's a problem. A really good practice is to declare variables at the very top of a procedure. Declare all of your variables at the top of the procedure. It helps you actually remember to declare them if you actually know, like, especially based on your pseudocode, right? If you go through your pseudocode and you know, like, 
hey, I need all these variables with these particular names, then declaring them at the very beginning helps you remember to declare them before you then get into the weeds of like actually programming and solving the problem and all that where you might be more likely to forget to declare them if you haven't already. Also, it helps you know exactly where the declarations are so that you can check names and types of all your variables. Um, it helps you uh, there because, you know, if you know exactly where they are, you don't really have to spend a lot of time finding them. But if you write a very long function, you might have to go hunting for it, for that variable declaration if you need to check the type of it or something like that. Uh, and I think this is especially helpful if you use comments to say what that variable is and what it's doing, all that kind of stuff. Comments are very helpful. Actually, yeah, I just said this. Use comments to say what the variables are. Uh, highly recommend it. The book doesn't say to do it, but use comments. Describe what the variables are, and also it's helpful to describe what some of the different steps you're doing, especially if they're complicated steps. You know, what those steps are actually doing. And here is an example of declaring variables at the top of a uh, procedure right here. Um, you'll see that after declaring these variables for the first time, you'll get this warning message from Visual Studio that says unused local variable double area. That's not a big deal. You can just continue actually writing out your code. And as soon as you calculate the area and store it in double area, Visual Studio will not give you that warning anymore. It's not the biggest deal if you declare a variable that you never use. You're using up memory that you're not actually using. Like you're taking up resources that you're not actually using, so it's not great to do. But like for now, in this context, um, it's not the end of the world. It's just if you get into bigger and bigger and bigger computing projects where memory is a lot more of a problem, which maybe you will, maybe you won't, I don't know, but like it might be a good practice if you anticipate learning more about code to not use more memory than you have to and um, not declare more variables than you're actually going to use. Well, that is memory and variables, and we'll actually talk about one other type of memory location later on through all these lectures. But that's what I'm talking about in the pseudocode and the flowcharts when I'm saying declaring your variables and you know all the background with memory and all that to go along with it. Uh, the next video is actually, um, you know, we're kind of going through the function for calculating the area in that circle area application. So the next part is actually figuring out how to convert strings to text so that we can store the, t the uh, or sorry, strings to numbers so that we can store the um, numerical value that the user provided inside of a variable rather than having to store a string and do some wacky stuff with that. So that's what we're looking forward to.